Hey everyone, it's Mr. Zabo. We are going to section 13.6 where we're going to jump back into circles a little bit and this time we're going to talk about equations of circles but they're going to start a little bit different so we're going to have to do some algebra here to get our equations in the correct form so we can identify the center and the radius. What I would like you to do is take a minute, press pause, and try these three warm-up problems. It's going to kind of lead us into some of the stuff that we're going to be doing today. All right, for these three problems, we hopefully got these answers, and then keep in mind here that we have to make sure we understand that when we have a binomial squared, that means binomial times binomial. So we are multiplying binomials here. Distribute your x to both terms, distribute your constant to both terms, combine like terms. And that concept plays a huge role in what we're going to be doing because what we want is to be able to create things that are perfect square binomials. That's how we're going to find the equations of our circles. To do that we do this thing called completing the square. So some of you may have done this in algebra, some of you may not have. This might be a little bit new. If it's new, go ahead and go a little bit slower through these notes. If it's review, go as fast as you need to. And, but when we're completing the square, I want this to be a perfect square binomial when I factor it. So what we're looking at here is standard form for a quadratic ax squared plus bx plus c. We are only going to focus on quadratics where the leading coefficient is 1, so when a is equal to 1. When that happens, to complete our square, we have to divide the coefficient of x by 2 and square it. That becomes the value for c. Then we can factor this into a perfect square binomial. Example a is 1, b is 12. If I take 12 and I divide that by 2 and square it, I get 6 squared or 36. 36 should be the value of c here. Then if I factor this, it becomes, I'll just write it below here, x plus 6 squared. x plus 6 times x plus 6. Those are perfect square binomial factors, I have completed the square. See if you can do that for numbers 5 and 6. They're both a little bit trickier in their own way. So for number 5 we should get 16 because even though it is a negative value for b, when you square that negative times negative is positive, it's still plus 16. And it's a little bit trickier when you have fractions as your coefficients, but 3 fourths divided by 2 is the same as 3 eighths, 3 fourths times 1 half, and when we square that we get 9 over 64. We've now completed our square. This concept is used to solve equations often. So if we look at 7, 8, 9, and 10, we can do this by solving, and I'll do 1 as an, 2 as an example, and you'll try 2 on your own. So just looking at these two, we can kind of see in 7 and 9, the big difference is that a is equal to 1 and 7, which makes us happy. We can complete the square now, and it's equal to 2 in number 9. We're going to have to treat that one a little bit different. So let's look at number 7 first. Now, what I really want to do, because that could not be factored, x squared minus 2x minus 5, is I actually want to move the, 5, the minus 5 to the other side, and I'm going to complete the square with my x squared minus 2x. That means I'm going to identify what I could put here that would make this a perfect square trinomial. So my b is negative 2, I take my negative 2, I divide by 2 and I square it. Okay, So that's a negative 1 squared, negative 1 squared equals a positive 1. So that means if I make this a plus 1, this is now a perfect square trinomial. I can factor that into x minus 1 quantity squared. It's x minus 1 times x minus 1. The trick is this is still algebra and in algebra with equations you have the whole equality thing. You can't do something to one side of the equation without doing it to the other. So since I added 1 to the left I have no choice but to also add 1 to the right. That's the equality. Now my equation is balanced. So this does not equal 5 anymore it equals 6. And the rest of my algebra comes from solving this quadratic. I have a value squared is equal to 6. To solve, I take the square root of both sides. A couple things you got to recall here about algebra now. 
That means I have x minus 1 does not equal the square root of 6. It equals plus or minus the square root of 6. And so I still have not solved for x. One more step to solve for x here, and that's to add 1 to both sides. So we get a final value here, and I'll just move it over to the side here, of x equals, these are not like terms, the 1 plus or minus the square root of 6. So there are two possible answers. 1 plus the square root of 6, 1 minus the square root of 6. That makes sense because it's a quadratic. And then quickly I'll do number 9 with you as well. Then you guys can try numbers 8 and 10. Key here is I'm not going to go and do the same process here. Not yet at least. And the big difference is that a is not equal to 1. This whole process won't work until we can get that coefficient of x squared equal to 1. So my first step now is actually going to be divide by that coefficient throughout this problem. Okay. And that's huge because now I've gotten my leading coefficient to be just positive x squared. Then it's 20 divided by 2 or 10x plus 16 and it's still equal to 0. Now I can go through the rest of the steps here. I can take my 16 and move it to the opposite side and have x squared plus 10x equals negative 16. I can complete my square by taking the 10 divided by 2 and square it. That's 5 squared or 25. Give myself a little bit more room there so I can show what I did. So I am going to add 25 to this side and then add the same 25 to this side. Now the left side is a perfect square trinomial. It's x plus 5 quantity squared and it's equal to negative 16 plus 25. That's a positive 9. Square rooting both sides. I'm not done with this but I get my x plus 5 equals a positive or a negative 3. And from there I subtract my 5 from both sides. A 3 minus 5 I would get a negative 2. A negative 3 minus 5 I would get a negative 8. And therefore completing the square and solving I get these two values. Go ahead press pause. Try numbers 8 and 10 please. So here's number 8. You wind up completing the square with adding 1 fourth to both sides. We're working with some radicals and simplifying radicals and square roots and get that negative 1 half plus or minus square root of 5 fourths. Can't have that square root of a fraction. Square root of 5 over the square root of 4 gives you square root of 5 over 2. You combine your terms that you can combine. We're left here. Go ahead and finish number 10 please. Don't forget, you need to make sure a is equal to 1 here, so you are going to be dealing with coefficients that are fractions. And we get 3 halves or 1. If you're stuck on this part, please make sure you get in touch with me, because we are going to be using this as we flip to the next page. And we've got the equation of a circle, okay, where hk is the center and r is the radius. Why are we completing the square? So that we can get our h and our k and our radius. We need to know the center. Take a minute or, or two, press pause, and do numbers 11 and 12. You don't need to complete the square for these. This is just review. Okay, so we've got our coordinates for our center and our radius. Take the square root of r squared, gets you the radius. If you have r, you've got a square to put it into your equation. Now the last few problems here are going to be kind of putting all of those pieces together where we're looking at 3x squared plus 90x plus 3y squared minus 12y plus 579 equals 0. We want that to be an equation of a circle like this okay, where we can identify the center and identify the radius. To do that, we have to complete the square, and in fact, we have to complete the square twice. Once with the x terms, and once with our y terms. All the rest of this we can move to the other side of our equation, but we need to make sure we have coefficients of 1 to do that. So the first step, 
is often look at you of 3x squared and 3y squared. That's good. I can divide all of my terms here, everything, because it is an equation, by 3. After doing that, I get x squared plus 30x, I get y squared minus 4y, and then I get a negative 193, or a positive 193. When I subtract it to the other side to get all of my constants on the right, my negative 193 goes here. Now, complete the square for x, complete the square for y. Remember, if I am completing the square for the x term here, whatever I add here, I must also add here. Same idea, if I complete the square for my y term here, whatever I add here, I must also add here. Take a couple of minutes and see if you can complete those two squares. So if you haven't noticed the factoring trick, once we get b divided by 2, we get 15. Square it, we get the 225. That's the number we're adding to both sides. But before we square it, we got 15. That's going to be the number I get here when I'm factoring x plus 15 squared, and it's also always going to take the sign of b originally. That was plus 30, so it's plus 15. And then conversely, when I had a negative 4 divided by 2, negative 4 divided by 2 is negative 2 squared, I get a positive 4, but it's that negative 2, or minus 2, that goes in for my factor of y. And then when I combine all of my terms on the right hand side, make sure I did it right, I get 36, so my center has an x-coordinate of negative 15 and a y-coordinate of 2. The radius is 6. This is a key type of problem. You're definitely going to want to make sure you understand how to do these problems. If you don't, let me know. We'll set up some time to get to go over that again. Okay. The last two are not necessarily the same type of problem. You may need to complete the square. You might not. Go ahead and take a pause and see what you can come up with for 14a and b. They're kind of grouped together. They're using some of the same coordinates. So 14a is about recognizing that you're given the center. You can get your coordinates for your center in here, and then you need to use the distance formula to find your radius. And I actually marked that wrong, but it's fixed now through the magic of making videos. Um, you have to square your radius. Don't forget that. Part B could be a little trickier if you haven't tried it. Go ahead and try that one. And here we have to make sure we're, the equation of a line is what we're looking for. And it has to be tangent to through this point. So we know, first and foremost, the tangent is perpendicular to the radius. So if I know this rep, these two points represent a radius, I can find the slope from the center to the point on the circle. Take the opposite reciprocal, use the ordered pair we're looking for, and find my y-intercept. I have the equation of my line. Please shoot me an email. Let me know if you have questions, if you want to go over any of this in more detail. Look forward to working with you guys. Hope everything's going well. Staying safe.